let's uh let's get it going here first off I want to thank everybody um for joining uh when we put this together this sort of was born out of a um obviously we're all in a weird weird circumstance here but um everybody uh this was born out, i got one more emailing me here to get in so why not okay go for it mark yeah hey why not? rush Haste. So, i don't have a hard stop me neither well i got an eight year old and a four-year-old running around upstairs that's so I'm not true hustling. that's true i'm not hustling to get up there uh <laughs> so we had a call with a bunch of teachers in the section and and we really enjoyed it we did a zoom call it was kind of a first thing and uh out of that was born the idea to do an education thing for everybody and then we had the idea to spread the wealth and try and spread it out. So it's been awesome. We had one Wednesday, we had 59 pros uh, as far out as California. And I think we've got California on this call. And I think we've got uh, Sebastian's on the call, I think from Switzerland. So uh, it's, it's yeah, pretty I'm cool. Here. So thanks a lot. There are two of us from Switzerland. There you are. Wow, awesome, so Sebastian, cool. welcome in. So welcome everybody to the MAPGA online education series. Um, it looks like everybody got the message here. If you haven't, please make sure you just mute your mic for me so we don't get any background noise. It'll make hearing everybody a lot easier. Um, we're going to open for questions at some point. We may just say, hey, open your mic up, ask a question. We'll see how that goes. Or an easy way also would be to type into the chat feature. If you haven't used it, if you tap on the screen, you should have an option in there. Uh, for chat, you can type something in there. I'm watching. I got a pad of paper here next to me, um, and I can certainly write something down real quick if we happen to miss it as we're going along. Um, and then we'll try and get as many questions in as we can. Uh, so hopefully that works for everybody. But again, please use the chat feature. Um, I'll, I'll keep my eyes on there for you. Uh, so just some introductions for those of you who are not in our section or don't know me. Uh, Mark Russo, I'm a PGA teaching professional here in Maryland in the Mid Atlantic section. Um, I'm the co-chair of the education committee for the section along with Sean English uh, and really happy to have everybody here. Um, Erica, you want to introduce yourself? I think everybody knows you. But sure. Um, I teach at Creighton Farms Golf Club here in Aldi, Virginia, and I um, am currently part of the player development committee for the first time this year. I used to help with education, but Mark, you've just done a, such a great job spearheading it the last number of years. Um, congratulations and good job putting all these together because you really took it uh, to the next level. So that was awesome. Um, you guys probably all know me. On the last couple of years, I've, I've dived hard into social media and uh, certainly have been able to leverage some connections with Golf Digest and Golf Magazine to try to get some growth that way. And I've um, caught the eye of, you know, different, different people that have helped me grow. And so I've had a really fun journey and that's what we're going to kind of dive into today is maybe some of the things that I did and also Mark too, what we've done to, um, to make that happen. Oh, oh. Um, oh you're screen sharing there, buddy. Kyle Warner. Oh, how do I get out of it? <laughs> uh, on the top it should say stop screen share uh, and you want to give me any of your bank account information uh well that's that oh that's actually not my screen uh you are viewing kyle warner's screen this is the fun part of using new technology oh boy yeah, just quit it and jump back in kyle there you go all right oh, sorry okay. good good we're good uh yeah yeah i think we're good uh, so everybody, basically what we're going to do is, um, you know, and again, please feel free to throw in questions. I'm going to let Erica start. I mean, I think, uh, everybody who has followed along has seen that Erica's really done some really cool stuff. So she's got some, some presentation slides she's going to share with us and go over. Then I'll, I'll throw my two cents in at the end, maybe a few questions. I think the main thing here is for us to help everybody figure out how to navigate, uh, the windy weird road of social media and how to make it useful for your business or your membership if that's the case for you uh and just talking about the platforms that are out there and which ones are usable for us and which ones maybe are not so much uh so erica you want to go for it i'm gonna go for it so let me All screen right. share here give me one moment Okay, so let's see here. All right, you guys see that? 
Yep, I got it. We're, we're up. Okay, so here we go, you guys. I'm gonna just tap and go here. So first things first, um, you know, I wanted to start with how do you start making content before we start getting into uh, the different platforms. That's gonna be the ultimate goal here is to make you understand some of the differences and how to use them. But I think the key points you wanna start with is how, what, do you, what are we doing? What, what's your message? Who are you trying to speak to? Definitely go through those ideas when you're trying to lay out a plan for yourself from here moving forward. So develop content that is engaging, relevant, shareable, and memorable. I think that probably one of the, the biggest tricks that I was able to uh, leverage was to try to create some content that was memorable. I tried to figure out what I could do that was different. And um, I was able to stand out amongst the, a lot of golf content that's out there. Um, and you know, making content that is appropriate for the platform that you are focused on if there's one or if there's multiple then adjusting it per platform um, dial in who you are your style look and message so we're going to get into some of the aesthetics but you know if you have a certain style if you're from california you're from new york you're a little bit more playful you're a little bit more serious you gear yourself to kids you gear yourself to elite players then you know your your overall look of your your platforms, um, your branding should reflect that. So try to be consistent and think a little bit about who you are and then who your, who your audience is and how that matches up. So you, if you have a really playful look but you're, and style, but you're um, trying to you know, teach maybe more elite players, does that match up? Maybe the answer is yes, maybe no. So try to really uh, dial in what it is that you're, you're, how you're presenting yourself and if it fits your audience. Um, how you can grow, we're gonna talk a lot about, you know, how you can tag and potentially collaborate with bigger fish, meaning when you're trying to grow social media and figure out what platforms you should be on, and that the whole point of it is to get exposure and put content out there that's valuable to your students, to your members, and to whoever else may find you, then how are you gonna get more people to find you? So, you know, using some different strategies to um, use other people, other vendors, other people that have bigger followings to help you grow is a really important point. Um, being really consistent with putting out content is probably the, the king of your journey in, in social media. You have to just get on that hamster wheel, I hate to say it, and you can't get off until you get some momentum going if you really want to do it right. And that was the biggest lesson that several different people told me when I was starting is just to post a lot um, early on and then get some get some momentum going and you know then figure out what your frequency is going to look like and what works for you but the people that grow the most um, post a lot however you still have to post quality stuff um, you have to have the right search words and hashtags if you want people to find what you're doing or you otherwise have a billboard in the basement so we're gonna go on here. This is kind of what my equipment looks like, um, minus a couple things I'll try to chime in, but uh, somebody asked me what tripod do you have? I just have a basic tripod that I bought like at Best Buy or something, it's a no name tripod, but the um, bracket I just recently bought finally, which was, uh, I had some different brackets to hold my iPhone, but this one has some, uh, racks on the top that I can actually attach my lavalier mics and stuff to. And if you have like a sunshade or they have different accessories, you can basically bolt onto the tops and sides. So it gives you some more flexibility of how you can film yourself indoors and outdoors. Um, I finally figured out how to get my sound quality better. I had a little wireless lavalier mic that was called Hey Mic and it Bluetooth to my phone and it was really easy, but it didn't work great outside and at long distances and the wind really, really affected it. So I finally upgraded my lavalier system and got the right cords that I needed. Um, what you need to hook up a lavalier mic, and this honestly shouldn't have taken me this long to figure out, but it was like weeks of searching YouTube to finally give me, somebody give me the answer as to what I needed to make it work with an iPhone. If you're using a DSLR camera, you won't have this problem, but since most of us work off iPhones and I literally do everything on my iPhone and my iPad, I film it, edit it, um, and record audio through it. All you, you need besides the actual lavalier system, which is down there below, I have a Comm Mucka one right now, that's the one I bought. 
is you need the iPhone lightning adapter dongle, which is that bottom right um, white little cable that usually comes with your iPhone. But if not, if you need extras, you can order those. Um, and then you need that special adapter piece, which connects the microphone to the dongle and then the dongle to your phone. And so in the left picture, you can actually see it hanging from the, um, the tripod. I didn't have it plugged in when I took that picture, but you get the point that it's like this little rigmarole of a setup. I have some lighting that I bought um, and um, it was a basic kit from Amazon. It included a green screen, which you guys have seen me use in some of my posts, but the lighting I used inside because it is bad, but they have all those ring lights and stuff and you can experiment with that to see what gives you better uh, lighting for indoors. Outdoors, you know, it's not a problem, but the one type of lighting that you don't wanna use is when it's directly overhead, if you can help it to get in a spot where it looks a little bit more at your face or from the side. Um, morning and evening is better to film instead of directly middle of the day where the sun is down on your face. It doesn't always look so good and your, sh your hat will shade your face. Um, so when you're trying to, you know, film things and get quality production, these are considerations that you want to look at. Um, these are apps that I use. Um, you can see not all of them are currently downloaded on my phone. The one I use the most is InShot. I'm going to show you a little screen share of what um, an editing uh, screen capture looks like. I tried to do it. I pre-recorded it. Um, I use Snapseed to edit some photos. I use Pick Play Post a lot to do collages. Um, there's other ones out there. I use Photo Cutout to create PNG files. So if I have a picture of myself that I want to use on a thumbnail or something like that, I can outline myself and then create a file that is like a, almost a watermark that I can put on top of other graphics. Um, I use Vscope Live as my green screen app. iMovie I use when I'm trying to do some different uh, effects and when I want to do a picture in picture um, or screen share type of effect on a screen. I use that um, and Fonto is another one that I use to um, create banners and different things for certain images. So I'm gonna hit play on this. This is when you open up InShot. This is every, I get a million DMs. I'm not kidding, I get a million DMs. What video app do you use? I literally use this 90% of the time. And it has everything you need. In two years, this app has, um, probably only cost me about 30 bucks with some of the upgrades I've bought, like extra little effects and stuff in here, but it's more or less free in the scheme of things. And um, it has a lot more features now than it did when I was first using it. It even comes with some music that you can use, but I did want to point out one thing before I start the video that I pay a subscription now yearly to something called Epidemic Sound, but there's other ones out there, epidemicsound.com. I guess it is, and I download copyright free music that I'm able to import into this app and then it gives me more options for music. Um, that was a tip I got off YouTube. I'm, <laughs> I'm very much a self-taught person in a lot of areas of life. I did a ton of research on YouTube and figured this stuff out. So always a good reference. So I start here and I click new. And then I highlight which video clips that I've already filmed that I want to use. This video I literally just posted about an hour and a half ago. So if you're looking to see how it turned out, you can look on Instagram today. So once I get the clips in there, I scroll through and try to figure out where I want to do my splits. So I'm going quickly here, but on the bottom, there's a little menu and I'm scrolling through the video to figure out where I want to start and end each clip. Stin some speed. Once you've got the hang I of add it, stin some speed. make it look good in between. So if I have a long running piece of film, then I'm going to just cut it up to make sure that I'm under a speed. Once you've got the hang of it, add a golf club. Three and a half minutes right now of how much film I'm trying to get down to one minute. And I have some outtakes, um, obviously, and things like when I walk on and off the screen, a lot of times I don't hit start and stop. I just let the camera roll until I'm ready to change position. So I have 20 minutes worth of film sometime and then I have to like, you know, figure out what my stop stopping points are going to be. Um, so this was just towards the end. What I did is I copied, I duplicated one clip that I wanted to put back to the beginning of the, of the tip as a teaser. So one strategy I use when I'm making content is to um, have a teaser image. So when people are scrolling through Instagram, they don't just get me talking. They have like a little, 
understanding of probably what the drill is or what, what I'm trying to get at, and then I go into it. So I find that that's a little more effective for me. I'm choosing the music. Um, I didn't like that one. I think I chose a different one ultimately. So I like this one for some reason. So I slide it over. I can adjust how loud I want to put it behind my voice on the video. You can chop up the sound. Properly so and not lose the right. Times. I'm almost done here. Here's special effects. Um, I wanted to add a little graphic about talking about the beginning of the backswing and like that it's powerful there. So oh, the backswing properly. So here's a drill. And uh, I think last but not least, I wanted to make sure then that add I tagged a golf my name across all of the video so i have some kind of like common text pieces that i use so i had that in there but i played with the um position of it and made it last throughout the entire clip so there's lots of little tricks i've learned just from using it but it's a very user-friendly app and i literally again do 90 percent of my videos in here sometimes if i need a special effect I will use a different app and import another clip, but I'll move on and you guys are feel free to ask questions. If Mark, I can't see anything. I'm only seeing my screen. So if somebody has a question that you want to like interrupt me and just, yeah. Uh, is there Eric, some, something I should add at this point? Yeah. Erica, um, Mark, uh, uh, asked, I don't know if that's Mark Kimena, uh, is this, are you posting once a day, more than once a day, twice a week? Just talk about frequency. Yeah. Um, I try, I try to post, when I first started, I posted every single day for several months. Um, I'm probably down to about two times a week right now, maybe three. And sometimes it's just like a quote or something simple, like a picture, but like regular video tips, you know, it might be, it's at, it's at least one, if not two a week is what I strive for. And then other stuff that fills in. In between my posts, I'm constantly updating my story as much as possible. Um, I'm going to talk more about Instagram here in a minute, but it, um, you know, the, the parts that keep you relevant throughout the week in between your posts are almost just as important. Um, so uh, let's see, I was going to dive into YouTube first and then come back to Instagram. And so really that first part of the presentation was just to show you how I'm making content and, you know, sizing it for the, the different, um, platforms is important. YouTube, I say it down there on the, the halfway down on those bullet points, but typically YouTube likes that 16 by nine uh, format. Um, although if you have a square format or another size, I think it does autom automatically format it for you to at least fit now where it didn't used to do that. It looked kind of like um, messy. So it does do a better job now than it used to, but if you can help it, you want to format your videos 16 by nine for YouTube. Hey, Eric. Um, yeah. Uh, quick one there before you kind of move away from that video you were showing us and how you were doing it. Mike Thomas is asking, um, how much time do you spend like on that video from planning to filming to editing? And we talked a little bit about that stuff on our call. So maybe just touch on some of the time it takes from beginning to end. I have a running list of ideas. It's just a matter of when I get to filming them. So my running list is always, you know, changing and evolving. When I'm teaching, I think of stuff, I write it down. And so I already have a list of ideas. If I need to sit down and brainstorm something new or hash out, you know, what I, what the, what the video I think needs to look like, like different shots that I want and stuff like that. Sometimes I'll do that before I start filming it, but a lot of it, I do it in my, in my head at this point. Um, like that skater video, I knew the drill I wanted to do. And as I was filming it, I was like, yeah, I should really show myself like from this view and how, if I was watching this, how would I want to see it? I always, just, I'm always asking those questions to myself. So I come up with the concept when I decide to film it, like for indoors, it's pretty concise. Outdoors always is more time consuming because there's, you know, the, I don't know, the camera blows over or their mower drives by or something happens and I get interrupted or, you know, I feel like it always takes longer outside. Inside's a little bit easier. Um, but basically it might take me 15, 20 minutes to film a one minute video. Sometimes it takes me one minute to film a one minute video if it's really simple. But by the time I get different vantage points, like, you know, obviously I like to move the camera around to make it, it flow a little bit and to make it more interesting visually. I'm redoing parts of the tip two and three times to get uh, the camera shots that I want. So maybe it's, you know, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes of filming and getting it right to the where I, I like how I set it. I like the way it looks. I check it really quick, make sure the sound is good so I don't 
think it's done and you know I messed up like the other day I went through a whole tip I filmed it and realized the damn plug wasn't plugged in the side of the camera and my audio was out so I had to redo the whole thing so I still make mistakes but you know I, I'm pretty pretty streamlined now so once I get into editing when I did the screen share today it took me um, nine minutes to edit that and I just did a, a little three minute you know shortened version of it so you guys wouldn't have to sit down um, the entire thing but it's it was about 10 minutes for me to edit that because I've done it so many times now I'm pretty quick at first it would probably take me a half an hour to do that um, some of the ones you guys have seen me make the more elaborate ones that are either longer in length or just way more complicated like my edutainment videos where I do my music videos and stuff that those are weeks um, it's weeks of time it's chopped up you know I'm working and teaching and being a mom and have life going on so when I come up with a concept and then I write the lyrics and then I do the karaoke and then I layer that onto the videos that I shoot, which might take me several different times and costume changes. And then I put it all together. It's like, it takes a while. Um, and the editing for some of those, you know, sometimes is hours. It's hours and hours of editing. Is, is it worth it? It's become a hobby to me because I enjoy it. And at the end of the day, I really um, have fun with it. So if it wasn't for that, if it felt like it was too hard of a process, I probably wouldn't do it, but I just really enjoy it. So a simple one minute tip for Instagram takes me probably, I'm probably in about half an hour to get that done. Um, if I was to try to dial it, dial it down. Mark, should I go on or are there other questions? Uh, no, right now we're good, uh, but okay. I'm gonna encourage everybody to keep type in the chat part. Uh, it just makes it easier for us to sort of, interweave questions in here with so many people on here rather than opening up mics. So feel free to do that, everybody, but uh, okay. not right now, Erica. So keep rolling. Okay. I'm rolling. I'll go, I'll keep moving here. So you've already read the screen. It's been up for a minute or two. You can um, see that um, I have some different pieces of advice. Um, one thing I learned recently, and I've tried to pay more attention to YouTube and do some homework on it is that the, they want, you're trying to get somebody to view your videos as long as possible. So if you have a one minute video, they can only watch it for one minute. If you have a 15 minute video, maybe they'll watch for five minutes or eight minutes or however long you can keep their attention. But rankings and um, um, your ability to you know, grow your channel a lot of times depends on how many, and monetizing your channel depends on how many minutes people are watching. So, um, it's very important. So the optim optimal length of a video they say is 15 minutes so that hopefully people make it to eight to 10 minutes and you'll rank more minutes watched. Um, optimizing your videos basically means that, that should say info cards. Sorry, there's a typo there. When you watch a YouTube video on the top, there's a little letter, lowercase letter I with a circle around it. And that when those pop up, people that made the videos have chosen to put links in at that part of the video. At the end of a video, the end screens that say, you know, hey, these videos are coming up next or click on this playlist, those are end screens and you have the ability in the YouTube studio to manipulate those. The description, people just like post a video and they don't write a full description. You should write a description, even if it's not long. Um, and then the, having a, a solid, you know, thumbnail, some kind of cover. I try to go back in and redo thumbnails every time I post YouTube videos and I was doing it for a while. Sometimes I get a little lazy, but all of these things optimize your video and tags. I'm sorry, search word tags, having keywords in TubeBuddy. What the heck does that mean? That relates to search words. So you can um, download a plugin called TubeBuddy. And this gives you the ability to search different combinations of words. So like maybe it's a bunker tip. So instead of just writing like bunker, maybe somebody's searching up, you know, how to hit a bunker shot, better bunker shots. Um, you're trying to find a combination of words that people are searching that has a high rate of search, but also high rate of uniqueness. Um, there's a word they have for that, but basically, um, you know, you want to stand out on the search engines and but also be in a category where people are searching for something that's popular where your video will hopefully pop up. So that's a way of checking your search words. Uh, you have to um, give a people to 
give people a reason to watch to the end. So really good YouTubers, even if they're not experts in anything, what they do a good job of, even a lot of the reality show type channels and things that my kids watch, they start out with, you know, um, hey, you, you know, we're here today, blah, blah, blah. We're talking to this person or we're going to go over this tip, but make sure you watch to the end because we're going to show you this awesome secret about how to hit your bunker shots better. You don't want to miss it. And then like halfway through, maybe at minute number six or seven, there's a reminder about, oh, hey, remember, you know, watch to the end of the video. If you want a chance to win, you're going to have to win some kind of prize. You're going to have to watch to the end. Make sure you like and subscribe. So constantly asking for the sale and asking people to watch to the end, even if they click ahead and skip part of your video, it still um, works in your favor for them to watch more and to watch to the end when eventually you can monetize your channel, which I have not been able to do yet on YouTube. I'm close. Um, there's a lot more with ad placements and how that works for you when you, um, when you are able to monetize and where those ads fit in. It's very, very interesting to look into this stuff. So I think there's a lot of potential to do cool things on YouTube, but you have to be ready to film longer videos. So, hey, Eric. okay, yeah. yes. So we got a few up here. Um, now, Stephen Herschel, I, I saw your, your question on here. How long should the videos be to keep the attention of your viewer? Um, I, I think Erica sort of covered that, but just chat me in there if, if, if you want a better answer, a more specific answer. Um, Mark Anderson's asking, um, what have you done? And I've got a couple more after this, Erica. What have you done that you find does not work? Just kind of in general question. Um, Maybe in that YouTube space. I haven't done enough. I have so much more I want to do. Like, I'm not sure how people will respond to more kind of vlogging type posts. I mean, I'm so instruction specific. I feel like there's a lot more I can do where I um, film, you know, more lifestyle, um, I don't know, pieces, you know, so there's a lot more to fill more content space. I think live lessons, things like that, like more, more people being a fly on the wall to what's happening, uh, over longer periods of time on the lesson tee or out on the golf course. I think that's probably more appropriate for YouTube and somebody watching YouTube has that mindset that they're ready to sit there and watch maybe a 10 minute video. Uh, or 15 minute video. If you're on Instagram, you're not in the mood to watch a 15 minute video. You just want to get in and out and see what's new and maybe some like quick trick or something. So, you know, you have to think about the audience who's sitting there watching. Also understand that um, YouTube is um, the largest search engine in the world, I think. Uh, maybe I'm misspeaking, but it's, if not, it's the biggest, it's, the, it's one of the biggest. So when you go to Google and you type in some search words, you know, the video options pop up. And so your ability to be found in the world, in the content space is much greater on YouTube than it is on any other platform, in my opinion, from everything I've researched, which is why I think it has the most potential to grow. And you actually have an opportunity if you work hard and you're consistent with it and you put out good content to potentially get monetized and it may not be a lot but i know the numbers that i see on some people that are really working it hard is very very inspiring so i'm hoping to um to grow to that point so we'll see if i can do it if nothing else when people find you on youtube then they then they follow you on other social channels and um and that is really really interesting too so erica just a um, couple other yeah. ones for you um and and we'll see if we can we'll go through these real quick. I'm going to go actually from the bottom because you, you hit a word in one of the later questions and then Mike Healy, I'll get yours on here. But Matt Snyder is asking what level of viewing subscriptions do you need to monetize? Yeah, I have that. Let's see if I can click ahead right here on the bottom. You need to have a thousand subscribers and 4,000 public watch hours, hours in the last 12 months. So I've been trying to work hard the last two months and I've been on YouTube for like 10 years, but haven't really been posting consistently until the last two months. So I am getting there. I have enough subscribers, but I don't have enough public watch hours, which is why I need longer videos on YouTube. Um, so I will go back a screen just, and you can kind of certainly look, there's a lot of info here. I just screenshotted this from some um, website that I found, but the, the, it's staggering. It's just staggering how many people are looking at YouTube every day. The average number of mobile YouTube views per day is, does that say a billion? A billion. I mean, it's just mind boggling. Um, so uh, that that's, yes. 
Oh, sorry, Arca. And then um, Mike Healy asked, in what frequency, um, this, might, this might apply more to maybe Instagram a little bit, but in what frequency to repost videos previously posted? My own videos? Yeah, yeah. Um, like, how, how often would you, you know, reuse something that you've created previously? Um, I think I've, I've, I've only ever done that about three times in the last two years. And that was like for holiday stuff where I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to like reinvent the wheel. I just didn't have time or something. So I reposted like my old Christmas video that I did the year before or something like that. But honestly, I, I don't ever repost. I just okay. always make new stuff. I, I just because I want to people do you know I think if I reposted some old stuff um, it wouldn't be a bad thing because there's a lot of people that saw my early stuff and new people that follow me now that never you know never saw the old stuff so it wouldn't be a bad thing I just don't do it um, so here's a channel analytics this is the last 28 days you can see as I'm trying to do a little bit more on YouTube what that might look like uh, and this is um, top videos in this period, just so you get a little insight as to what I'm doing. Um, these are some old videos, but some of them still remain some of the most viewed that I've had. Um, I, I'm not, again, a pro at YouTube. I'm trying to learn, but I'm getting better. Whoops. Um, here is where we are now. So if already, I'll move on to Instagram next, unless Mark, you wanna chime in yep. with any other YouTube thoughts yourself? Um, well, I'll cover a couple of things when I put my screen up there. I mean, I think okay. you're, you're nailing it here uh, with a lot of this. I mean, one thing I'll just add in there is the live lesson stuff is something that I've added in mine under some suggestions. Uh, I talked to Martin Chuck about that and Martin definitely posts a lot of that stuff. And he, 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 he told me, I mean, he's shocked at how many people will watch a full hour lesson on yeah. YouTube. Um, and so I've posted a full hour with a brand new student and I do lesson looks where there's snippets of lessons where I'll turn the camera on, but it's, I think an effective way to give people a look into how you are on the lesson tee in the wild, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I think it's really good. Um, I, I got another question here for you, actually I'll hammer a couple out real quick here, Erica. Um, Go for it. Jeff is asking, do you suggest having a series of videos that cover the same topic, part one or part two, that you post on different days if the topic you are discussing is too long to do in one video? So absolutely. I think it makes it more manageable. I think you could post it different ways. Like YouTube is endless. You could post it in smaller snippets and then put it together in one long one and post it different ways. There's no, no problem doing it that way or save the smaller snippets to doing like a whole series on Instagram. So maybe you roll out part one on Monday and part two on Wednesday and part three on Friday. And then you put the whole thing up on YouTube all put together on the weekend or something. So, um, that's you know how I would play that, but I think it's a great idea. It kind of keeps people engaged and like wanting to come back to see what maybe part two or part three is. And you know, on Instagram, as you guys may know, they they've changed their platform over the last couple of years. Um, but the short videos are always still one minute or less. Long videos, I don't know what the cap is on IGTV now, and I think it depends on your level of followers. Um, for me, I think I can post 15 minutes or maybe more. There was a point in time I couldn't post more than 10 minutes, but I don't know if that was just me or if it was everybody um, at that point in time. So those IGTV videos, which you can then put the preview on your home profile page, you know, that's a good place to put a two, three, four minute video that might be part of a series. But I still think on Instagram that the one minute or less videos are way more shareable, way more taggable with people. People can repost and reshare those a lot easier. And it's it, it, a lot of it, again, who are we kidding? A lot of this is about how many eyeballs can I get on this video? Um, how many people will want to share it? And how easy is it for them to share and save? And you can't always do that with the longer videos on Instagram. So there's a, a place and a time for it. But I think the short ones are most effective. If I was going to say what I did wrong, somebody asked that question is I, when I was starting to experiment with IGTV, I didn't realize that um, those longer videos, people couldn't share them as easily. And so I, I, I kind of wish I would have reposted some shorter versions as regular posts and tagged people differently so that they might've gotten a little bit more exposure. I've also posted things maybe at 
um, not ideal times. So I'm going to show you a screenshot of the back end of my pro of my page, you know, of when people are on Instagram. I mean, I try mornings. I, I post a lot in the mornings because it's easy for me and I feel like people get up, they're on their way to work and they're probably checking their social media accounts. And if they're used to seeing my new posts in the mornings, then they'll be more trained to look for it. But you know, posting at noon might be a good time. Posting in the evenings, when are your viewers actually watching? Watching Instagram, you can see those things on your back end. Uh, before I show you those other screenshots, a few other points here, you probably just already read them while I was talking, but um, updating your story. The story is a really interesting phenomenon to me. So those bubbles at the top of the screen, um, at, on, the, on just like a regular, you know, you're scrolling along the bubbles at the top, when you see different people's um, pictures, when you click on those, you see their story. So this may, some of you may not even know about it. I have people that are like, I don't know what you're talking about. I never click on stories. But whoever is posting most recently, their story gets moved to the front of the line. So if you're on there and anybody's paying attention to stories, like I always see the three or four people I always see, and you're gonna see me highlight them, are Natty Golf and Mike Berry. And there's a few others, Tor Striker, obviously Martin Chuck, he's always up there. Like. So I don't know if it's just my feed because I'm always clicking on them, but whoever you're clicking on and whoever's updating, who's ever somebody that you're following that's updating their story goes to the front of the line. So if you're constantly updating your story, there's more of a chance somebody's going to click on you, see what you're doing. They may not have, they might, they have may have missed your post of the day or the week, but if you like pop it on your story and reshare it, it kind of gets another life and then more people may see it and they'll remember that you exist and that, oh yeah, there's that new post. I missed, I must've missed it two days ago, but here it is. Somebody that's really good like that is Kathy Kim Goff. She's always reposting stuff on her story and people use stories in different ways. Like I did a whole um, story for golf.com last week with a whole stretching routine. So they did it that way instead of putting it on their page. So I did a, a story um, of dynamic stretching. I think it was like 18 layers. Um, that was a lot, it was probably too much, but that's what it was. And you know, people do a lot of those Q and A, they're more interactive. So you can ask a question, you can ask a poll, you can say, do you like this shirt or that shirt? Do you like um, you know, this drill or that drill or whatever? You can like ask some funny questions on there. It's more interactive. People DM you, you start to really have a higher level of engagement with your followers. You have more loyal followers, I think, when you start to build relationships through stories. For me, I use it as a place where I share more kind of like personal everyday stuff and reminders about events and things going on. I leave my whole page on Instagram always just for my golf instruction content. I don't really hardly ever put anything personal on there, like family pictures or anything like that. Like I just leave it strictly golf tips so people know what they're getting um, and it have a consistent look to the way your whole page looks. Um, captions, there's so much I could keep talking about. This is Natty, me and Mike Berry, uh, just to give you a look as to like different looks for the page itself. So when you're scrolling down Natty's page on the left, She's very consistent with the colors, the titles, the way everything looks. If you're scrolling your feed, you know it's her immediately. Uh, for me, I've used the same two fonts like for two years now. So for me, it's kind of about that black and white, very kind of chalkboard, playful, um, colorful. That's more my style. And I think it's consistent throughout my page if you were to scroll down. Mike Berry is now on this pattern, which is really cool, of reposting from his Twitter, which is a whole nother thing, right? But he he double dips on his Twitter comments and uses them almost like quotes or questions or facts and starts conversations. He has a really high level of engagement on his posts. So he kind of goes like video, quote, Twitter, whatever. And you can see he's got it all dialed in. It looks pretty cool, like a checkerboard pattern. Um, I pay attention to this stuff. I've done a lot of social watching. And so I have tried to mimic some things that I like just because I think that I understand there's a strategy there and it works for people and they obviously have 100,000 followers for a reason. So here I am and the top, I just wanted to point out that this is important. Um, a lot of people don't realize you can't put live links in captions. The only place you can put a live link on Instagram is in your profile. 
And also in your stories, depending on your amount of followers, like now I'm able to link and swipe up for different things, but I couldn't always do that. When I had a smaller amount of followers, when I reached a th certain threshold, there were like more benefits that opened up to me. I want to say it was like when I got to 10,000, but um, you know, the live link is really important and you can only put one. So that rain or shine one, a lot of people are asking me like who, what net is that in my basement and what mat do I have and all that. So I just left it up there and that link, if somebody clicks on it and purchases something is an affiliate link. So I'm getting a few bucks here and there if somebody actually buys something from rain or shine um, with that link. It doesn't always work, but at least it's there for now. And I try to change that regularly. So when I post a new video that might have like the other day I did one, and I tried to direct everybody to YouTube because I just to try to see if I can mix it up. So instead of posting the video to Instagram, I posted a picture, a thumbnail, and then I said, go to YouTube to watch the video. So now I was trying to get people to go to YouTube so they would maybe subscribe to me over there. And I put the YouTube link in my bio. So uh, that, that was a strategy. That was a conscious decision to not post that video on Instagram for a reason. Um, my... Uh, link there, you can use a service called Linktree. Some of you already do this, I know, but that is a way that if you click on the link to Linktree, it's another little page that opens up and it gives you the opportunity to post multiple links. Like let's say you have your website, your YouTube account, and maybe like an affiliate account, different things that you want people to click on. It's a way that you can have one link that leads you to a tree of links. So you can use that as a um, reference. So this is what I was talking about earlier, growth ideas. This is a good example. This, this one did very, very well. I did this a few weeks ago and maybe it was just a good creative tip. Maybe I just got lucky with timing, um, but maybe it was the hashtags. Maybe it was who I posted and tagged. Um, I also, the language in my caption was very interesting. When you look at it, I said, tag a friend who stands up. Okay, so if you are a golfer, you know what that means. So I got a lot of people to tag people just from suggesting to tag a friend. And guess what? When they tag a friend that's not following me, maybe they'll start to follow me. So a lot of times you'll see giveaways like that, like tag two friends and like this video and you'll be entered to win some, some um, cool gift, like a new hat I'm giving away or something like that. I've done that too. Um, it does help. So tag a friend, giveaways, challenges, um, tagging vendors is a big deal. So I'm always tagging Callaway Golf, hoping they will repost. I'm always tagging um, clothes that I'm wearing, so hopefully they will repost. And again, it gives me more growth. So on the right, there's a difference between tagging in your uh, caption and tagging on where it says tag. So on the picture of my video, which is cut off, there's this little icon of a guy, like a little person in a circle underneath the word that says start start standing to find your distance. So there's, that's where everybody's set, who's, who's actually tagged in your video is listed. And like, if you click on somebody's picture that they've posted, you're gonna see little boxes pop up of who's tagged in the video. That's not gonna happen if you just put their name underneath in the caption. You actually have to physically tag them. And there's a difference in how it pops up. Anybody that's physically tagged in the video, it shows up on their page, which is a big deal. You get more exposure. So every time I truly tag Golf Digest, there's those three windows on the bottom of a page. You can scroll over and you can see who's, who's tagging there. So basically there's a way to get on your other people's pages by tagging them. Um, people do it to me all the time. So I tagged Hitting It Solid and a couple other companies here. Golficity is a big one. They, they have a big following. Um, and so hopefully, again, they, it alerts them that this might be something they want to repost, but it also goes onto their um, tag page. Okay, enough hey. about that. Yes. Um, just to, as we roll through here, because I'm going to, I got a few more questions we're going to yes. throw in here. So we're probably going to go a little longer than, than original, which is totally fine. But how do you create the space gaps uh, in the video descriptions on Instagram? Kellen's asking. Um, so let's see, go back one here. I think you're talking about like down below where all those hashtags are. I think, are you talking about that? 
I guess. I think, um, oh, that's probably what he's talking about. Yes, he said yes. I well, just yeah. hit I just hit enter and then just put those little dashes. Um, it's just right off the keyboard. I'm not doing anything fancy there. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, I've had yeah. that. You, you sometimes have to put the dashes in there or whatever because it won't space things out the way you want necessarily just by hitting, you know, return or whatever. You've got to yeah. put some something in there. So, okay. By the I wanted to add one thing here. When I was first getting going with Instagram two years ago, um, I I have one, I have my, my golf, my book, A True Swing that I wrote in 2017. And I figured, you know, maybe I'll link, I'll keep linking, um, people to, to hopefully want to buy the book on Amazon or on my website. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I would try to run a few ads on certain videos that were like, had a, a sell through link, um, and to see how that went. And for what it's worth, you know, if you have something to sell, I don't know that it's appropriate to run ads if you're just like, you have a golf tip, although you could, and then say, follow me. But if you have something to sell, a book, a video series, or an ebook, or maybe an, a subscription to your website or something like that, um, if you put a cool video together and you run it as an ad, it's very, very cheap. And yet I found that it was pretty effective. Like I had some, a couple of them I ran and I definitely not only got hits on what I was trying to sell um, for, you know, it was like the campaign was, I want to say 20 bucks. You could pick whatever price you wanted. So let's say I was willing to spend 20 bucks over the course of three days. Well, it was going to suggest how many eyeballs that was going to get me. And it was pretty much right on like the amount of new followers or the amount of sales that I was able to achieve based on the advertising was really pretty good. So I haven't done a lot of that in the last year, but early on I did some of it and I may revisit it, but in case you guys are wondering about ads, that little button that says promote, so whatever video you think you want to use as an ad, you just hit that button and you can check into what the campaign would look like. And you can spend five bucks, you can spend $30. It automatically figures out ge geographically like where you want to target and you can like filter it out. It's really pretty cool. Same thing on Facebook, although I've never done a Facebook ad. Um, you know, I, I don't use Facebook a ton. Anything I share on YouTube or Instagram, I basically double share it on my golf page on Facebook, which is just one thing I wanted to point out. I feel like Facebook is kind of this space where it's an older demographic a little bit. Um, you have personal pages, you have business pages. There's obviously no time limit on the videos you post or how many pictures you post or anything like that. So it's much more wide open on what you can post. I feel like tagging people definitely helps reach, but I just don't think it's a great place where you're going to grow a ton in terms of finding new people to follow you, unless you're just relying on your current friends to, when you invite them to like your page, to like it, and then hopefully they share it. I mean, you have a lot more opportunity to have a lot more growth on, on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube when there's hashtags and search engines. Facebook has some search capabilities, but I just don't think your people use it as a search engine nearly as much as the other platforms. That's my personal opinion. Uh, maybe somebody out there knows more than me or uses Facebook more for that. But the way I use Facebook, when we talk about the different ways to use platforms is I would use it as a tool to create exclusive platform, exclusive uh, formats for discussion for your students uh, or potential clients, meaning Let's say on Instagram, I, I am promoting or on YouTube, I am promoting or on my website or at my club, I have a new online course or some kind of subscription where then they, it's a, they have the ability to come chat with me one on, you know, in a group setting or one-on-one -on -one or Q&A. Like now I can create a private Facebook group where people can come in and there's that community feel. You guys have all been a part of groups like this. You know what I'm talking about, so I won't go into it, but that's, that's what Facebook is. I feel like it's more of a forum group um, place where it's really good for uh, adding value to maybe exclusive programs, whether it's for your membership or for a student base. And it's an easy way to set up that because of all the privacy settings, which is another point. Um, when you're posting stuff on Facebook, you have to make sure your privacy settings are correct. So I think even the other day, Mark, you were trying to share something or somebody was trying to share your post and they couldn't. I think yeah. I saw a comment like you had to probably go in and change the setting. I mean, so it all like we don't even know sometimes we don't pay attention. 
But if you're putting stuff out there and people can't share it, then what's the point? You know, I'm you're just putting it out there for, for who? For your current database? Like you want more people to see what you're doing. You have to check your privacy settings. Um, I had one, one, a couple people that have said, ask me questions and then I go to see their page and it's private. And I get if you want to keep your stuff private, but if you're, if you're trying to do social media to grow your following and grow your business, I think you need to turn your stuff to public and then keep your personal and personal, you know, family, girlfriend, boyfriends, kids stuff, put it on a different page, you know, so keep your business stuff separate and make it public. That's my opinion. Now there are some, um, strategies to keeping things private. There's sort of this like allure of like, oh, what's behind door number one? Maybe I have to click, you know, ask for permission to join to see what they're doing in there, especially that they have, you know, 500,000 followers and they're private. What is that? You know, there's almost like this reverse psychology about having a private setting sometimes, um, especially like on Instagram, but on Facebook and, you know, even on Instagram, I think that being more just open and putting stuff out there and, you know, just sharing as much as possible it makes people feel more like access you're more accessible to them and then they, they want to share your stuff so let them i'll pause here and mark i'll let you chime in on facebook if there's anything else and then i think the next thing is linkedin and twitter and i feel like you're going to be a little stronger in these areas so i'm going to i'm going to let you go go forth here my friend Okay. Well, I tell you what, Erica, what I'll do is, and I've got some questions on here. I think what I'll do is um, if you want to, uh, I'll do a screen share and just run through my stuff real fast. Uh, obviously you've done great with this and I'll, I'll cover quickly just Twitter and LinkedIn. And then we can also yeah. make sure we're sharing these with everybody too. And then I want to rapid fire some questions with you um, that I've got uh, over here that I want to <laughs> get answers to. So um, let me just pull this up gang. Everybody can see this and I'm doing it correctly. Whoa. All right. All right. So, uh, Erica, can you see this? Just want to make yes, sure you're. I can see up. it. All right, cool. So, just real quick, um, for me, just my rundown of my stuff. And I'm in the boat with a lot of you where I'm trying to build it up to where Erica's gotten it, you know, and. I've seen some pretty good growth this year through some consistency in some different areas. So I've been on Twitter since 2008, but it's more for me uh, from uh, just a chatting and basically doing hockey stuff on there as a Capitals fan um, to turning it into business. And now I don't do any personal type, type chatting on there really anymore. It's all, um, you know, business related stuff. So, the question really is when you're on there, what's the value in it for you? I feel for, to my business, it's low. It's more of a professional networking and news source at this point uh, than it is uh, anything else. You know, value from learning and networking is much better. I, I've met a ton of pros on there uh, and really made new friends and learned things through the networking aspect for Twitter. So that, if you're looking for platforms on how to grow your business, then I think Twitter is going to be one where you're going to kind of maybe not look, get much value out of it. And as I say here, it's really easy to go down the black hole on Twitter and get into arguments and all that stuff. Michael Breed is really big about that. It's like, don't even bother wasting your time and ruining uh, your business, your culture, what the view of your business and how you do your social media by getting into a rant with a knucklehead on, on Twitter. So stay out of that area with it and let it be something where you can network, maybe post a few things. Maybe you can uh, share posts from other areas, but be careful of it ruining your culture. Um, and one thing I want to note, note too, and I, I think you'll see this with all of Erica's stuff too, but you'll see it as I go through mine is a consistency in my banners. I don't know if any of you have uh, specially made YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook banners that are sized correctly but it's really important. The thing you see at the top here, my banner, I went in and found somebody on Fiverr, which is just a great site where you can hire basically a graphic artist type person to make stuff for you. And it's super cheap if you're not good at doing that stuff. Now I can now do some of that stuff myself on Canva, but it was really great for me. So having some consistency in your look and message is really important. Uh, for Facebook, I just put on here in the middle of the screen, sort of, you know, Eric was talking about the older demographic. This is just pulled off recently. There's your age group and demographic stuff. So 
you know, and, you know, I talked to my wife about this, who's a public relations executive. And she said the 25, I was kind of surprised at this. And she said the 25 age is actually viewed as a little bit older, quote unquote. Um, I wish I was that old still, but it, it is still viewed that way. So just interesting to see the stats here. Um, I added a business page in 2012 when I started my business. And it's, I think, good for, as Erica said, the community part. I think it's great for creating the culture and um, creating conversations with your, with your students. I, I agree with Eric about the community. Um, the age range is all over, but the value to business to me, I think, is still reasonably high, especially on my page, because I do te teach people who are in the uh, late 40s to early 60s, uh, and they are on there and they are active on there. Not Some of those are in that 50s and 60s range. Well, not particularly active on Instagram. Uh, they're still kind of getting it with that. So it's important to have all your bases covered. I think it shows who you are and you can kind of create a picture too of your, your brand. And, you know, Erica talked about it a little bit. I have done some boost posting and gotten some decent results from it. Uh, really depends on what you're doing, but I think sometimes it's worth it, honestly, just to dip your foot in there and figure out what um, you want to do and give it a, give it a shot. It doesn't cost much. and You can be very specific with your area. And I would tell you to, uh, obviously, Erica's expanding to a much wider range. But here's what I would say to you, too. If anybody is a member of Proponent Group, Lauren Anderson has mentioned this many times, and that is make sure you own your area in a 30-mile radius. Once you start doing that, then you can start branching out beyond that. But if you don't own your area first, I think you got to take one step at a time, okay? Um, and the bottom one too, Erica brought up too, my issue is family or not. So I have my personal page uh, that's private and I had to open up one of our posts to share it, but I, I choose to keep all my family stuff there. When you look at my social media stuff, you will rarely see me post something with my kids in it for my business side. Um, I, I'm just a little leery of that. I'll throw them in there occasionally, but Typically, I try and keep that out of there. Some people like to do it. I know Martin Chuck has his kids on there all the time um, and includes his kids in there. It's really up to you what you feel comfortable with. Uh, Instagram is really where, I, you know, I got into this ball game late. And in, when in 2016, when I hit go on this, I had absolutely zero clue what I was doing. Um, but clearly, this is the hot one to be a part of. And, you know, to Erica's point, too, about tagging bigger fish, if you will, to use her term, uh, I've gotten a whole bunch of followers in the past two months from being tagged in some other things. Uh, I did the wedge matrix thing with James Ridyard and James posted one of my videos on his page and I got 50 followers in a day. So being involved with other people, uh, as Erica calls them, the bigger fish can really be helpful. So the value to the business for me has been high. I got a lot of students who follow me there and you can still learn and network through that, but value to my business is high. And I think you really have to figure out who you are and show it. And that's what Erica is so good at. And I think, you know, you can see on my right side there, it's just a screenshot from this morning of my page on my phone. So there's a lot of variety to it. Uh, and that's how I choose to do it versus a pattern or what have you. Um, you know, I made mistakes early on. You know, Erica talked about having consistency. I made some mistakes early on. Um, trying to create this image that, you know, I wanted to have all these posts look the same and, and I was going to do these, you know, really uh, set things. And I felt like it just wasn't me. I think you got to make sure you make mistakes and figure out who you want to be and who your what your culture is and what you want to show and make that your pattern and be very consistent with your brand. It doesn't have to be what everybody else does. Obviously you got to do some things like Erica talked about to get more people um, there's a lot to it, but make sure you're being true to who you are and what you want to do. Um, and I will tell you too, you know, Erica gets a lot of views on her stuff because it's cool and it's, it's different. I've gotten more, I got more views on a post I did last year of me hitting a bunker shot out of the snow in front of my teaching area than I have on a lot of my other teaching videos. People look at different stuff. So I think you got to be patient and growing and make sure as Erica said, you tag other people. Um, YouTube. So very sporadic when I started, I started a page immediately when I started my business. Um, but I was very sporadic. 
this year, after having a conversation, many of you know Eric Cagorno, and Eric has been on a mission the last two years to grow his brand and use YouTube as a massive weapon to do that. If you don't know Eric, look him up. And I spoke with him and he gave me great advice. He said, look, man, you just got to do it. You got to be consistent, at least post once a week and make sure it all looks good and you're consistent. And what I've done is I've started to post weekly and I also changed my thumbnails on my page, as you can see there. So yellow is for my lesson looks and purple is for my tips. And I will tell you in, the, in gosh, maybe seven, seven weeks, give or take, of really bearing down and posting weekly, I've picked up 50 new subscribers that way, just doing it organically like that. So it's small, but that was, gosh, a 20% increase you know, in no time. So create a banner. Again, you'll see the banner at the top for consistency. And uh, you know, Eric has great video, but I think, you know, Eric, I think you would agree with this. Audio quality is number one. Would you agree with that, Erica? Yeah, it's important. Actually, early on, I did a lot of nonverbal videos because they were easy to shoot. I didn't need to worry about the microphone. I didn't have to worry about the mowers. I could just like film it and then put music over it. And I did it. I did it that way, which worked really, really well. Kind of just not strategic. I didn't do it that way strategically. It just that's what I did. And it, it worked. It was different enough, actually. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that, especially for the short platform, the short little bursts. But I think for, you know, YouTube, a hundred percent, the audio makes a big difference when you have a lot more talking and a lot more length. Yeah. And I just think that, you know, somebody turns a video on, maybe your quality isn't perfect of a video, but your content is really good. But if the audio is bad, they're out of there. Like if they can't hear you, they're gone uh, in no time. So you can forget it. And I think the other part too, and Eric mentioned this to me too, you know, be original, come up with your own tips, your own ideas. But look, let's remember too that most of us are teaching things that we learn from other people and it's okay to look around at what others are doing and get ideas from them. Just make sure you're packaging it in your own way. I mean, there's only so much original content in terms of ideas and teaching stuff you're going to do. Maybe you get outside of that box and you can be more original, but don't be afraid to look around. And then length of videos, Erica already talked about that. And, and uh, you know, uh, I've heard the same thing she talked about too. Uh, I need to make my video longer at times because of the minutes watched. So something to think about and learn. Um, okay, so, and I know somebody posted in the comments too. We're going to get to those uh, as fast as we can here. But LinkedIn, um, I barely touch it. And... Uh, I get very low usage out of it. My wife, again, is an executive and she's done presentations to large groups in the executive world about using LinkedIn. So the question really is, is it valuable to us? I think it's low on the totem pole um, for networking. It's high. And honestly, it's a career-based professional network. And this was the quote she made this morning. We were talking about this. It's position yourself as a uh, as a, oh, I might have typed that wrong, as a leader in the professional, a thoughtful leader in the professional community. Sorry, bad typing this morning and then have my coffee. Um, it's really more about looking for a job. Uh, keep it updated. You know, it's just not high in the totem pole for what we're trying to do. Um, so last thing too, Erica talked about her tools. This is a picture actually of my wife doing a Facebook Live yesterday. Uh, doing the mom thing, juggling my four-year-old, helping him, her, he's helping her cook on a Facebook Live thing uh, through her work. But what you'll see is my lighting that I use for some of my indoor stuff, the ring light, uh, that cradle up there. I've got everything on the left here for you, but that's from Biographer. I really like it. Uh, Amazon basic uh, tripod. I'll use a Rode boom mic, which is on the front of that light. You can barely see the little um, gremlin thing on it. I use that for some of my indoor videos that are quicker. It's still good and I talk loud, but I have a Samson mic uh, that's fairly inexpensive um, that I use for my YouTube videos because obviously sound is super important. Um, and I think the other piece too is mixing up some of your video too. It doesn't always have to be on a tripod. It can be kind of fun and crazy at times. I think it's good to mix it up so it doesn't always look so studio perfect um, as long as the audio is good. And I think the final piece on this, and then we'll get to some more of your questions here before we wrap up, is just, I, I say this a lot to uh, other pros, and I think it's important, and I've learned this through um, you know, my, my business. Figure out who you want to teach and figure out how you want to reach them. Uh, obviously, Erica's really good at that, 
and uh, I'm getting there. And I think the, the piece here, that's, I love this picture. This is in one of my video summaries that I do at the end of a lesson for every one of my students. And he jumped in there in the lesson and, and talked on the camera. And I just, I, I snapped a picture of it because it kind of grabbed me a little bit, but show them how, that you care, show them your culture and bring them in as a part of your family and have fun doing it and be genuine. If you can do that, you will be successful and you just got to take it one step at a time with this stuff. So that's kind of my, my two cents on that part. Um, so what I'd like to do is see if we can, Erica, I'm going to fire off some questions here for you. Cause I want to make sure I can get to all these before we, we sign off. Uh, oh, I see that question there about TikTok. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. So I want to go back to where I ended. All right. So real quick, Erica, we're going to kind of move through these fairly quick. Okay. So uh, for instructors getting into social media, what platform would you suggest for first time users? Instagram. Okay. There you have it. I agree. Totally. Work your way, get Instagram, work your way up into a good YouTube yeah. channel. Uh, any tips or advice for starting out and not being confident enough to speak over instruction videos and how to break down that barrier? Good question, Kellen. Go ahead, Erica. You can do the nonverbal, show it and put some text up on the screen. And then like, you know, try to just, even if you don't post the verbal ones, just practice doing it. The only way you're going to get better at doing it is practice. And believe me, I have lots of outtakes. Um, you know, it's rare that I get through it. Like on the first try the way I, where I like it, sometimes it's like good enough and I could post it, but I'm more of a perfectionist and I like go back and do it again. So, um, yeah, yeah just keep practicing. I agree with that hundred percent. Kellen, the best thing you can do, man. And I, I did broadcast uh, communications in college. So I was forced into the front of the camera and, and had to do it uh, early on, but you just got to turn the camera on yourself and practice and mm -hmm. be okay with starting all over, watch good speakers. And I know you got a little advice on there about the, I think the Carnegie stuff. Um, look up ways to get better at it. But the only way you're going to do it, honestly, is just turn the camera right on you and get, yeah. get after. One last note on that is I feel like I'm generally expressive, but when I look at myself, I'll play it back and I'll redo it. And I like act it more because it just doesn't come across like you think it's going to. So you almost, I feel goofy and sometimes I actually am goofy, but like I have to like over express what I'm trying to say and how like smiley or serious I'm trying to be because it just doesn't come across the same as how you think it's going to. So overact. Yeah, that, that's a great point. One, one last piece there. And uh, uh, my sister has, has been uh, done television for 30 years. Uh, she does stuff for Comcast and some other stuff. And she has taught me all along. She's seen my videos and she purposely over smiles and over animates. And she's constantly harping on me about that because you'll never do it as much as you think you will yeah. uh, when, when you do it on video. So that's a great point. Uh, Brian Jackson, better to drive traffic to your YouTube page or IGTV? What do you think, Erica? Um, I think the, oh, tough question. I don't know, Mark, I, it's a, I'm split. I would say Instagram because again, more people can like share it than YouTube's a little bit harder. Yeah, I, I agree. I found I mean, the, gro I, the growth is a lot. The growth is a lot slower on YouTube. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, you know, it's, it's shorter and you can start there and build a following there. And then you can start pushing those people to the bigger platform, yeah. if you will. So yeah, that's, that's great. Um, Sebastian, what video quality do you use on YouTube to make it look good, but avoid the file being too large? I just do everything on my iPhone. Yeah, honestly, I, Sebastian, I don't even pay attention to, I mean, I use the highest quality I can do. It's, it takes yeah. a little while sometimes to put my YouTube videos up, but I mean, I've got a good MacBook that I spent money on, which was worth it. But yeah, I don't even really, I look For, at the highest there, quality. One thing I did find out about YouTube is the optimization I was talking about. If you have 4K or now 5K is going to start coming out more, right? 4K videos are rank higher on the search engines. So if you have the ability to put your video into 4K, film it in 4K or like produce it in 4K, you should do that. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, Jim Estes, does tagging a follower like George Gankus, who has a lot of followers, increase your followers? Yeah, uh, if he, yes. I think associating yourself with people that have big followings 
helps like just in general, but then as long as they do something about it, then it has potential to increase your following. So um, I used Mike Berry as an example and he reposted a couple of things I did just even in his stories and like on a certain time, he was like, follow this person, follow this person. And sure enough, like I had like 50 or hundred people when like in a couple of days because he did that and he was just being nice, but he was genuine. He's like, no, no, your video is really good. Like I'm going to reshare it. I was like, okay, thanks. But yeah, I mean, tagging somebody and hope, you know, there's no sense, no harm done in tagging somebody. If the worst case scenario is they just don't do anything about it. Like, yeah, you know, but they might repost it or they might, you know, respond. If, if, if you get a big name commenting back on your posts, people see that. I've noticed that too. Yeah. I mean, have I, you ever I, noticed? Yeah. I mean, and like I said, I mean, Ridyard posted something on there and it helped me get a ton of followers. And yeah, I mean, Jim, if Gigi reposts something that you, you put out there, I mean, yeah. it might break your phone, man, uh, with Gigi. So, uh, that, that's big. Um, Joanna Co, uh, can you tag on IGTV? I can't seem to find that button or maybe you can't on IGTV. That's why, that's why I'm telling you, you got to get your videos under a minute and then you tag people. You can't tag properly on IGTV. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. I got to roll through these because Zoom's going to kick us off at 2.30. So what strategies do you use to boost your following? Uh, you can hit that if you want real quick, Erica. I mean, I think we, I think we went through it. I think yeah. we went through uh, it. Okay. How can you utilize PGA coach in addition to Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube? Jeff, I'm not sure how to answer that one. I mean, I'm going through the PGA coach ADM thing. I don't know how you, I'm not sure I have an answer for that one. Um, have you done the PGA coach yet, Erica? I didn't finish it. I started it and I didn't finish it. Yeah, I'm still doing it. Um, like obviously got plenty of time. Um, I did okay. it. It's, I, you know what? I'm not so sure it's going to help you that much. I don't know enough about social media to know if it's worth it, but I, I mean, I did it. It was good. It was helpful for your business, but it, I don't know about followers and tagging and all of that. I have no idea. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not so sure. Um, okay. Let's see. Pete Weisel for junior coaches. The kids' parents were also on Facebook. Uh, let's see. Erica, where do you find your creative inspiration from? <laughs> Just like listening to the radio. And <laughs> I don't know. I, I try to, I take things literally. I, it's funny. I, as I was I kicked myself today. I posted that skating video and I said to myself, damn it. If I just like thought about it a little longer, I should have dressed up like, like a skater, like California should have put my vans on and like done some like stupid thing in the beginning. Like, see, that's it. And sometimes I, I, I have that thought before I film it this time it was pro it was retroactive. So I'll have to save it for like six months from now and I'll redo it yeah. like skater style. But I always like, or put on your hockey gear or something like make it so that all of a sudden people are like, what the hell is he or she doing? Why is she dressed like that? Or what point is she trying to make? You know, it just catches somebody's eye. So um, I could have dressed up in capitals gear and talked about, Hey, you're missing hockey these days, but I have the skating drill. Like, you try to be relevant to what's happening in the world around you. We're all doing it with quarantine and coronavirus now. We're all tagging those, by the way, right? Every time I post now, it's quarantine life, coronavirus, COVID, um, indoor drills, like all these hashtags so that people are searching them. Hopefully I pop up in the search engines and I do think it helps a little bit, but you're being relevant. You're talking about what's going on in the world. And I purposefully, you know, when I think of something and I have these analogies, like I did the big, the Nerf gun, um, Caddyshack one last year about aiming, aiming a gun. So now I tagged Nerf and I tagged like all these different people that are not in golf. So I got in front of a different audience of probably like younger people, but so be it, whatever it is that are into Nerf guns and they like follow hashtags about Nerf. Hopefully. So maybe I picked up a couple of random nerf followers that are golfers. I don't know, but it can't hurt. So, you know, yeah. I think of it like how else can I reach more people that are outside of golf that might be golfers, but just don't know me. There's other things they're into and, um, you know, uh, just be relevant. Think about what's coming up in the news. It's an Olympic year. Um, hopefully, right. Um, things like that. Like what else is coming down the pipe that you could tap into and relate to and 
you know, make it visual, make it different, uh, stand out and, and don't be afraid to, you know, don't be afraid to think that anything's not worthy enough. Sorry. Yeah. Good. Next question. No, and I think that's awesome, Erica. Uh, and I think, for, you know, from my perspective, I've picked up some followers because the only other stuff other than golf that I really post on my Instagram page is fitness stuff from my gym. And I get, I haven't really, you know, I've taken some time to do it, but I've gotten a nice home gym together and I get all my stuff through Rogue, which is a, you know, US based, Ohio based company. So everything I tag gym wise is, you know, are you rogue, rogue fitness? And I've got a bunch of followers actually from those folks. And I do hashtags, you know, all those hashtags. And then rogue found a picture of my gym that I took and they want to use it. So get to Erica's point, you know, you might find some things outside that you can get. Um, and there's nothing, okay. there's nothing wrong with pitching an idea to a company. Like if you have yeah. something that's going to be a fit for a company, say, I'm going to do a series of videos and like, you know, I can tag you guys. What do you think? And what are you going to do in return? Maybe it's not a monetary thing, but maybe they'll send you product or at least they'll share your stuff. You know, if I do five videos for you guys, will you share them? It doesn't hurt to ask, you know? So I think pitching ideas like that is a really good or collaborating. So let's say you are personal friends with, maybe it's not George Gankus, but you know, somebody that is a bigger following and say, Hey, I want to do these videos. Will you like do an Instagram live with me? Will you um, you know, send me a little clip. Like I did one with Martin Chuck year, uh, a year ago with his smart ball and he filmed a little nugget for me. He was really nice. And then I like montage the video. So now he's in the video. So he shared it. So now I got in front of the entire tour striker audience, which is pretty big. So it's asking people for, for, to work with you. Um, they, they get it, you know, I mean, I'm happy to do that for, for people sometimes that have asked me, but not many people ask. So if yeah. you're bold enough to come up with an idea and ask me to do something with you, maybe I'll say yes. The whole PGA show video I did was because of uh, Gia Boker's idea. She pitched it to me. I said, let's do it together. And now, you know, she, yeah, she gained about a hundred people from that post. So, you know, it does, does work and I'm open to ideas. Uh, Erica, real quick, we're going to fire off the last couple here. Um, Cause we're going to be close on time here. Um, have you ever done Google ads to help your website traffic? I signed up for it, but I don't know. It's like in my website. I couldn't figure it out. I just, I don't yeah. pay attention to it anymore. I look at some um, of the analytic reviews, but I, I haven't messed with it too much. Um, yeah. It is a little, um, a little difficult to follow. And it, it's, you, you it's more connected. for your website too. And I don't drive yeah. as much traffic to my website right now. I don't, I mean, I, I don't know. I do. And I don't for people to sign up for lessons and maybe they buy something, but I don't know. I'm not driving as much traffic to the website. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I think we got, Oh wait, one last one here, Erica, real quick. Uh, have you ever, there's no way I'm doing this. TikTok. <laughs> uh, so it's funny. I, I knew of it, uh, before I feel like it started to get really more and more popular. My, I knew it was musically and my kids were following it and that's how I started learning about it. And, um, I used it a little bit to drum in some music into some clips and I don't know, I was sort of like using it that way. I, I'm not a TikToker. Maybe I could be, but I, I don't, it's a different audience. It's a younger audience. And yeah. if you don't know who Charlie D'Amelio is, you need to go look her up. She has like 45 million followers. Like every post she does gets like five million. She's a teeny, she's like a 16, 15 year old girl in Connecticut that just posts pictures of herself dancing. Like it's, it's unbelievable. The culture on TikTok is a whole nother animal and it's probably not for your average golf instructor. You have to, I think it's a younger audience it's much more music and kind of trends and challenges and um it's short it's very very like 15 seconds short 15 seconds <laughs> like you got no time to get across any kind of instructional message so trick shot artists are good on there like it has that kind of wow factor i would encourage you to look at it and understand it because your young students are going to be on it um but i don't know that it's a realistic platform to grow as a middle-aged golf instructor i don't right. but maybe it could be all right, so uh, we covered some serious ground here, folks. I appreciate most everybody staying in with us. Um, I put up on the chat, our next one of these is um, April 8th. Wait, let me make sure I'm not messing with that up. Okay, yes, April 8th. Uh, John Scott Rattan and Pat Bettingfield are going to be doing another one, uh, 1 o'clock on the 8th. There's John Scott's email if you want to sign up. Um, 
same uh, bat time, one o'clock. They're going to cover uh, club fitting and instruction together. Um, if you don't know John Scott and Pat Benningfield, uh, they're great instructors. And then April 10th, I'll be back on. Uh, if you are a club fitter, you don't want to miss it. Uh, cause Kirk Aguri, top 100 club fitter, one of the best club fitters I know, uh, and is known by all the club manufacturers is going to be on with us. So if you want to understand club fitting better, uh, how the trends are headed and all that good stuff, you need to join us for that one too. Uh, so again, I'll be posting all that stuff on social media and putting it on Instagram, reminding everybody, but it is also on the MAPGA website, mapga.com. Uh, if you if you want to see the schedule, you just have to sign up by emailing the particular host, which keeps it way easier and simpler for all of us. Um, so if anybody else doesn't have any questions, uh, in terms of one quick last thing too, in terms of MSRs, if you're an MAPGA pro, uh, we're submitting the list and you guys will get your credit. Unfortunately, we found out if you're not MAPGA, you have to submit to your section on your own behalf. Um, because that's just the way the rules work. Um, but you can still get the MSR credit. It has been approved that you can do that. If you have trouble, let us know, but you should be able to submit it uh, to your section. So Erica, thanks for doing this with us. Thank you for organizing it, Mark. Great job. Thanks for everyone yeah. sticking around. I know that was a long one. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you guys Bye. so Bye. much. Guys. That was awesome. All right. We'll look forward to seeing you all April 8th for the next one. See ya. Thank you. Bye.